begin this chapter, let's talk about some over-the-counter medications. These drugs are approved by the FDA, but they do not require a prescription for purchase. We use these drugs in everyday life. We use them for headaches, muscle cramps, and many other ailments. We're all aware of the fact that there are still some dangerous interactions with other medications in our patients who might be taking over-the-counters in addition to other medications. We should also be mindful when patients are buying over-the-counters in this day and age, especially with such a huge population buying their medications online. We need to caution them about counterfeit drugs. We all know they're out there. Many people want to buy their drugs from Canada and places like that just because they're more cost effective for them. And our patients who are older and live on um, a restricted income, this is appealing to them. When we do a medication reconciliation for patients, we want to assure them that we want to include any over-the-counters that they take so that we can reconcile for any interactions among those. So it's easy to just request that your patient bring those to the facility with them. So you can also look at the active ingredients and know the exact dose that your patient is taking because not all over-the-counters have the same milligram dosages. Over-the-counter products are typically considered to be safe and effective for people um, who use them. They, again, do not have to um, have a direction from their healthcare provider or a prescription to use those. So you have to realize that many people will resort to over-the-counters, herbals, vitamins, and things like that before ever seeking counsel of a physician. A few things we need to be mindful of also when we talk about over-the-counters and interactions with food and other drugs is alcohol. Many over-the-counters that can be purchased do contain alcohol. As you saw in your book, alcohol is sometimes one of the hidden components in certain medications. Generally, this is going to be your cough medication, so we want to make sure that if we're dosing a child that we have the appropriate cough medication for them. We should never, ever, ever give a child a cough syrup that contains alcohol. So now let's talk about the labeling of over-the-counters. The labeling information for over-the-counters are sometimes a more in-depth reading than what you get on a prescription drug from your pharmacy. So your patient may be taking the FDA approved medication that contains active ingredients um, that may interact with some of their other medications. So we wanna make sure that we're looking at the active ingredients listed. Um, this label should also have the purpose for this particular over-the-counter. It should have warnings and directions. And remember, with all of this information that is required to be on one little bottle, your patient may have difficulty reading that, especially in your older population. That's why we encourage them to bring those with them when they come to a physician appointment so that we can look at those ourselves. Now, when we talk about the actual contents of over-the-counters, if you will look at page 348, you can see some of the chemicals um, contained in those medications and some of the common active ingredients. This is going to be um, some of your common hidden chemicals. Remember we talked about alcohol. That's one of the very first ones you see. And again, we talked about those being in cough syrup, 
They're also found in mouthwash. We typically don't ever think about mouthwash when we think about over-the-counters, but you have to be mindful of those things, especially in children and recovering alcoholics. Can you only imagine the problem that could create? So we have a recovering alcoholic that has a cold and wants to suppress his cough, his or her, I'm sorry. And now we've fallen off the wagon because we've given a cough medication to someone who has a vision impairment and can't read about the alcohol contents. And now we've created a larger issue than the cough we started to treat. So as you look at the table on page 348 with the common active ingredients and over-the-counters, if you look in the hidden drug column, you will again see several of them listed. Calcium is one of the big things that patients probably don't really pay close attention to. Um, calcium, however, is a huge factor um, to anyone who has a cardiac disease or some type of kidney disease. Um, those patients should be very mindful of um, taking those because they have to monitor their sodium and magnesium levels. So if it's hidden in some of the counters and they're unaware of that, they're putting themselves at risk. We all know that calcium blocks the absorption of iron and it can um, affect our kidney function. It does, however, aid in uh, bone loss prevention, but it can cause constipation. So if they're taking some antacid and they also take some type of calcium supplement, then they're probably getting way more than they need. Just a few other things to close out over the counters. We also want to be very mindful when we are dosing children that we use the appropriate container that was provided, um, the medicine cup or the dropper, things of that nature. Remember we talked about kitchen spoons are not the same as a dosing spoon that you might get with that particular medication. We also need to be mindful of every single person who purchases over-the-counters need to be aware of expiration dates. Yes, over-the-counters have expiration dates just like every other medication that you would get by prescription. So we need to be mindful of um, tossing those medications once they have expired. Now if a patient has a medication, they've torn the label off, they don't remember the dose or things of that nature, we need to make sure that they're just tossing them. They should no longer take them. If they're expired, their efficacy is no longer there, and we don't want them taking medications that they can't identify. So let's start here with our herbals. If you will turn to page 222 in your ATI book, you will be better able to follow along with this lecture with all of the typical herbals you might see a patient taking. Or you may see these when you're doing a med reconciliation. Herbals, as you know, are widely used in patient populations from teenagers to geriatrics. Um, the medications, however, are not regulated like our prescription medications. So this presents a challenge when using herbals supplements in our patients because the formulations can vary from company to company in production. It makes it so much harder to pinpoint therapeutic levels. So let's start with aloe vera. Of course, we are pretty familiar with aloe vera. Some of us even have them growing in our homes. We are known to use them for burns, the alleviation of burning at the skin, skin softening, 
and even for some of its anti-inflammatory properties. Of course, we always need to be mindful of hypersensitivities, even to natural plants and herbals. You'll notice in the adverse effects of aloe vera that patients need to be mindful of their fluid and electrolyte status because it can be used as a laxative. Remember, laxatives can be potassium sparing or potassium wasting. So when we look at that aspect of using aloe vera, we have to be mindful of interactions with a patient who might additionally be taking diuretics and have some type of cardiac history. You will also notice drug interactions include the medication digoxin. This goes back to aloe being a laxative and stimulant laxatives typically decrease potassium levels. The risks of the side effects of digoxin are increased. Digoxin, if you remember, is used to treat heart failure and some dysrhythmias, including AFib. And the way that the digoxin works is it alters sodium and potassium in the cells, thereby reducing the strain on the heart. And that allows the heart to maintain a steady rate in a normal pattern. So moving on to black cohosh. We've heard tons and tons of uses for black cohosh. Um, it's widely used in women who are perimenopausal or menopausal. It acts as an estrogen substitute, so it will alleviate some of the symptoms of menopause. Remember, we've talked about some of those being hot flashes, vaginal dryness, and it is usually even taken for the prevention of bone loss. So look at the adverse effects of black cohosh. Some of them are typical, your GI distress, lightheadedness, headache, and weight gain. Of course, we all know that estrogen plays an important part in metabolism, so many women who are in a menopausal state are going to have some weight gain. So it is important that we remind our patients to check their weight prior to starting any treatment. Now that we know black cohosh is an estrogen substitute, we need to be mindful in assessing our patients for other prescriptions for hormone therapy replacements. We also need to address pregnancy status because taking black cohosh while pregnant can induce labor, so be mindful of that. Um, it's also been shown to increase the effects of antihypertensives and insulin, so be sure you're assessing your patients for the use of insulin and those other medications. Echinacea is a dietary supplement that people use for common colds and other infections. They are known to stimulate the immune system. Um, this supplement has various uses. It is believed to decrease inflammation. It can heal certain skin disorders, um, burns. Um, it is also used to increase the level of T lymphocytes. Remember, T cells are a type of leukocyte or otherwise known as a white blood cell that is an essential part of our immune system. So with echinacea, you want to be sure and assess for allergies, especially if you have a patient who's allergic to ragweed. Now, many of you have may or may have heard of feverfew. Um, it's a perennial that that blooms that belongs to the daisy family. Um, its leaves are typically dried for medicinal purposes. Um, some of you know patients or people will tend to use fresh leaves. Um, it is used as an anti-inflammatory as it inhibits the synthesis of prostaglandins. Um, it's typically used to treat migraines and a few of the other medicinal benefits are used in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, stomach aches, toothaches, and I think originally it was used to decrease fever. So one of the first things you notice about feverfew is that it can block platelet aggregation. 
So it is suspected that it prevents the release of our COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitors and the platelets stimulated by thrombin. So with this particular interaction, we want to make sure that we are assessing any prescription medications that a patient might be taking, such as warfarin, heparin, or any type of NSAIDs. Now, moving on to garlic, of course, garlic is not only taken in tablet form, but is used in many of the dishes that we cook at home on a daily basis. Um, one of the most well-known benefits of garlic is that it can lower LDL and it can raise our good cholesterol, which overall helps lower triglyceride levels in patients um, who may be having some issues with high cholesterol. So again, be sure that we're assessing these patients um, who may be taking some type of medication um, that can affect or increase bleeding as garlic also inhibits platelet, platelet aggregation. So be mindful of teaching your patients about the risks of taking those medications alongside any other medication that affects bleeding. Let's look at the safety, purity, and effectiveness of our herbals. Um, most of you know herbals are just plants or a specific part of a plant that we use for its therapeutic properties. Many of these supplements or herbals are sold in various forms, um, tablets, capsules, powders, extracts, and even tea. Millions of us use herbal medications to improve our health and wellness. Um, we, of course, have to be mindful when it comes to a patient's choice in using natural herbals, supplements, or whatever over prescription medications. We do not want to impose our own personal judgments in the use of homeopathics or herbals or any other type of treatments if that's what your patient so chooses. Remember, we are there to support them and guide them, but ultimately that decision lies with within them. I myself see them as pretty safe. Um, most people feel the same way. Um, these are posed as natural. Um, however, we all know that's not necessarily true. Some herbals in use, they don't go through the same rigorous testing or FDA approval like prescription medications or over the counters. So it's extremely important that when we as nurses do our med reconciliations, that we also look for certain prescription medications in conjunction with over-the-counters and herbals, um, and that we educate them on the proper use of specific, of the specifics that they're using. Um, we want to, again, make sure that we're assessing for interactions and educating them on those. Um, some of them can be very serious and life-threatening, especially for those who take herbals that might interfere with their anticoagulants or even their antihypertensives. Um, so we want to be mindful of, of those and educating them about them. So quality control of some of our herbals are not um, up to par. They're not as pure as some of them claim to be. They again are not regulated by the FDA. Uh, many of them claim to be very pure, but the definition of pure is much like a definition or the use of within normal limits in nursing. Each person has their own normal and what I may see as normal or a specific level of purity may not be seen by other companies the same. Many times our patients resort to complementary medications and alternative medicines um, such as herbals because they've tried conventional medications that have failed them. They're not getting those therapeutic effects that they 
may be getting with herbals. So we want to support that. Um, many times you'll hear, especially um, statins for high cholesterol, if you look at the side effects of those medications, it's very easy to see why someone might resort to an alternative medication in the herbal category because of the decreased side effects. The effectiveness of herbals and over-the-counters vary from patient to patient, just like conventional prescription medications. We don't always see the same effectiveness or the same result in every single patient every single time. So what works for one may not work for others. And it's basically trial and error. Um, many of the patients prefer herbals. Number one, it might be a cheaper route for them and of course the reduced side effects are always a perk with herbals so let's start with ginger root Ginger root is an herbal that has been used since ancient times for various ailments. It's thought of as an antioxidant that helps treat arthritis and inflammation. So this also treats different types of infections. Ginger root is thought to have some antibacterial and antiviral properties. Of course, we all know that ginger is also beneficial um, in the digestive tract. This is most likely where we get the old treatment of ginger ale when we're sick and feeling nauseous. Ginger root is thought to relieve vertigo and nausea. Again, it does help with intestinal motility, so this is why you get ginger ale and sometimes some of the other medicinal drinks that contain ginger in them. Now, ginger root can also be used to treat morning sickness and motion sickness, so you want to be mindful about um, patients who may be pregnant and using this because in higher doses it can cause uterine contractions and therefore lead to preterm labor. So we want to be mindful if they're taking it for morning sickness that they are taking it appropriately and they should really consult with their physician prior to using this. Now this Two is a supplement that interacts with um, coagulation, so be mindful of patients who are also using warfarin and heparin. Okay, and this um, ginger root also increases hypoglycemic effects, so make sure you're assessing for um, any of your patients that might be using insulin in conjunction with this particular herbal. Now moving on to ginkgo biloba, this one is extremely important to some of us who are getting older and more forgetful. This one promotes vasodilation, so it is perfect for those, including myself, who tend to be forgetful as my age increases. Um, it increases blood flow to the brain, so it acts as an antioxidant in that way. It's beneficial for other um, ailments also. Now, studies have shown that it can be helpful in patients with a diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, it seems to help prevent the progression of symptoms. Now, be mindful of the fact that it does not prevent or cure the symptoms or the disease. It's only been shown to slow the speed or the progression of the two. Now, this is one of the first that we've talked about that can actually interact with medications that lower the seizure threshold. It specifically lists your medication, um, imampramine, I-M-I-P-R-A-M-I-N-E. So when you're reconciling your medication history, be sure you're educating your patients about this particularly because as we lower that seizure threshold, you know that your patient might be more likely to have seizures at that point. So know that we need to assess for any other antidepressants or any other antipsychotics that your patient might be taking prior to starting or suggesting this supplement.
Now, glucosamine is pretty straightforward. It stimulates the cells to make cartilage and synovial fluid. Therefore, it alleviates some pain and inflammation in the joints. Glucosamine is um, typically used to treat osteoarthritis in the knee, hip, and wrist areas. So you can see some of the adverse effects and precautions are your, of course, mild GI upset, nausea, heartburn. But one you should take particular note of is um, that this should be used cautiously in anyone who might have a shellfish allergy. Um, glucosamine is actually harvested um, from shellfish. It's found in them naturally. So make sure that we're doing a proper assessment for allergies. Now, kava is actually an extract that is said to, um, it's a bitter supplement. Kava itself is a popular drink in the South Pacific areas, um, which most of them compare it to beer in our society. So as you see, one of the first things it shows in your ATI book is that it can cause liver injury. So much like alcohol can cause liver injury, so can kava. Kava is sometimes taken to relieve anxiety, some stress, insomnia, withdrawal symptoms, muscle pain, infections, migraines, and even psychosis and depression. So you can see that it acts on the GABA receptors in the central nervous system. And remember the GABA receptor or neurotransmitter is one of the inhibitory neurotransmitters. So it helps promote sleep, decreasing some anxiety. Um, so you'll notice one of the adverse effects um, that chronic use can lead to is liver damage. Of course, with liver, da liver damage, you are going to see jaundice. Okay, I know you all know what to assess for um, it, when it comes to jaundice. So we know that it works on our GABA receptors, so we need to be mindful of taking too much of it and causing significant CNS depression. Remember, with CNS depression, you're going to see a decreased rate of breathing. You're going to see a lower level of consciousness and probably a, um, some greater difficulty in arousing your patient. Okay. So knowing that your patient might be using this particular supplement, we always want to question their use of alcohol and any other CNS depressants. Um, or you also need to assess for any current liver damage before starting or suggesting this particular herbal. So moving on to Mei Huang. It is a traditional Chinese herb that's derived from ephedra. So knowing that ephedra is very similar to ephedrine, we can determine that the effects of this supplement is going to be one that increases um, activity in our CNS. Um, you can see in the book that one of the first noticeable things about this particular supplement is that it can cause hypertension, tachycardia, stroke, or even an MI. Of course, these go along with the increased stimulation of the central nervous system and thus our cardiovascular system. This supplement can be used for weight loss um, and because it constricts, um, this is where you're going to see your blood pressure increase, your heart rate increase, and your patients are going to report hypertension. So if you guys notice in your book, the adverse effects of this particular supplement are hypertension and dysrhythmias. And if those are left um, untreated or unreported, they could lead to death in some cases. Um, it can cause euphoria in higher doses. Um, so be mindful of the possibility of addiction. You will notice that this drug also interacts with MAOIs. Remember, monamine oxidase breaks down epinephrine in the central nervous system. So if we are taking something that's an inhibitor, it's not breaking down that neurotransmitter that would normally be broken down, therefore making more of it available. So if you're taking that MAOI, 
and you're taking this supplement, then you're facing a possible overload of stimulation to your CNS system, which in turn puts stress on um, your cardiovascular system. Therefore, adverse effects. Now, throughout this trimester, we have talked a lot about St. John's wort and the numerous medications that it interacts with. St. John's wort is typically used for the tr treatment of depression. So we have to assess our patients, um, the medications to make sure that we're not taking St. John's wort in addition to another medication that increases our level of serotonin. Okay, so remember if we have too much serotonin, then we get into trouble with serotonin syndrome. So remember some of the things with serotonin syndrome that you might see um, would be that increased body temperature, um, increased agitation, those hyper reflexes, tremors, or sweating. So when we look at the adverse effects of St. John's wort, you'll see that it's dry mouth, lightheadedness, constipation, and some GI issues. Um, this is also one that can cause some sun sensitivities, so you want to be mindful and educating your patients about the use of sunblock or limiting sun exposure altogether. Now, St. John's wort, of course, decreases effectiveness of oral contraceptives, warfarin, digoxin, um, and several others. So be mindful of educating your patient on the use of backup contraception. Um, we need to make sure these patients are continuing to go for their labs, um, their PT, their PTT, INRs, especially with the use of warfarin. Tall palmetto is used to alleviate um, symptoms of an enlarged prostate. Sometimes you'll hear me refer to it as BPH, it's the same. Some of the possible interactions with this supplement is um, it interacts with finasteride, and that's typically a medication that's given to treat alopecia or hair loss. And this is a medication that is typically prescribed um, for treatment of an enlarged prostate. So again, just reconciling those medications to make sure they're not taking a prescribed medication and a supplement for the same issue, okay? So one important thing with this particular supplement is to make sure before your patient has any prostate-specific antigen testing that they stop this medication because it tends to shrink the inner lining of the prostate. So it can skew the results of that PSA testing. And lastly, valerian. Valerian increases GABA to prevent insomnia. So remember, GABA is one of our inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters. So when we increase GABA, um, it basically turns off the, res the brain's response to stimuli in our patients and therefore less interruptions when they're trying to sleep. So this supplement reduces anxiety also and can cause some drowsiness. Um, so be mindful of precautions for that. Now it does say that the interactions of this medication and others are undetermined. So we need to assess our patients where they might be taking a medication for any type of mental health disorder um, prior to using this medication, okay, especially when we're using or referring to our GABA receptors, okay, so just be mindful of that. So moving on to vitamins. Vitamins are a chemical compound that are naturally found in plants and animal tissue. We tend to take vitamins, of course, we do not typically consult with a physician before many of us start taking these, just because they don't require a prescription and we don't really always see the need for a second opinion in taking vitamins. We take them in hopes to um, just maintain a healthy status. There are thousands of people who take them on a daily basis and not really ever think about any side effects or interactions with other drugs. 
So vitamins, as we all know, are an absolute necessary um, and essential part of metabolism. We cannot live without these essential vitamins. Um, if you look on page 351 as we go through this, you can see those vitamins listed there in table 19.2. So there's two classifications. We have the fat soluble, which are found mostly in plant and animal oils. Um, your book has a cute memory dogger to help you remember fat soluble versus water soluble. So you'll see that on page 350. It talks about a fat cat on a deck. So the A, D, E, K are going to be your fat soluble vitamins. If you can remember that saying, you will remember that when it comes to test taking time. Then we have water soluble vitamins, and there are six of those. Um, so the water soluble vitamins are B vitamins, folic acid. Again, if you look on page 351, you can see the whole list of vitamins. Um, make sure you know the difference in the two. Um, you'll see that. The water soluble vitamins are your B vitamins, and most of you will recognize vitamin B12 or um, B3, but most of us typically hear them called by folic acid, niacin, riboflavin, those types of words rather than B3, B6, B2, and B1. So water soluble vitamins are destroyed quickly um, by heat and sometimes light. So many times you'll see these in containers that are the dark brown amber bottles um, because they are destroyed by heat and they are quickly excreted um, through urine. Um, if we are lacking certain things in our diet, we begin to see some deficiencies. So you have to think about patients who may not always have the income to eat healthy um, or have some type of limits as far as obtaining certain foods. Um, so with those deficiencies, that brings on a need for replacement. Um, most of us who have a healthy diet are typically maintaining a healthy level of these vitamins. Um, normally when we are looking at vitamins and um, supplementing those for our patients, we always want to refer to the RDA or the recommended daily allowance of our vitamins. Okay, again, we realize that vitamins come with risk also, especially when our patients are taking mega doses of fat soluble vitamins, which are stored. Okay, so the difference in the two are fat soluble vitamins are stored, water soluble vitamins are not. Okay. We can quickly become um, toxic, especially with certain vitamins and especially with children. Okay, so if you have someone taking iron, okay, um, especially with children, that can um, lead to an untimely death quickly. So with that being said, we need to make sure that we are keeping these medications out of the reach of children in proper containers with the child-proof cap. So let's go back to our fat soluble vitamins. Um, this includes our ADEK, okay, and these are all needed to maintain good health, okay. Um, remember there is no benefit as far as um, excessive vitamins. Remember the water soluble, if we get too much of those, it's just simply excreted in urine and therefore we've just wasted <clears throat> those vitamins. Many of our patients will say, well, I'll just take more and that will increase my level. That is not the case. And we need to educate them about the fact that our body can only metabolize so much and the rest is excreted. So when we talk about an excess of vitamins, the term you need to be familiar with is hypervitaminosis. Okay, it can occur in patients when they take greater than, of course, the recommended daily allowance, um, and in one in particular is vitamin A. 
Okay, vitamin A is extremely important um, when it comes to our vision, and it is also important in um, repro reproduction. Okay, this helps develop um, a healthy growth in an embryo and in an immune system. However, we can overdose on vitamin A, and there are consequences. So hypervitaminosis, again, um, is someone receiving greater than 25,000 international units. Most of our vitamins you will see either listed as IU or spelled out as international units. So one contraindication with vitamin A is going to be your cod liver oil. And of course, this goes back to your hypervitaminosis because cod liver oil has been found to contain large amounts of vitamin A. Okay, so we also have to be mindful of foods because if we have someone taking a supplement for vitamin A um, and then again they're changing their diet to increase that, we do not want them becoming toxic. Okay, so some of the few foods that we can um, discuss are, again, your dairy products, of course, fish, men liver, so your, also your cod liver oils, spinach, broccoli, and some of the dark orange vegetables, okay? We always hear that. Eat your carrots, maintain your vision, okay? So um, be mindful of those dark orange vegetables. Also, when we talked about hypervitaminosis, um, we also want to educate um, patients who are of childbearing age. Um, it can interfere with birth control, um, so we need to be cautious about that. With hypervitaminosis, what happens is early on it can cause birth defects in the fetus, so we want to, again, educate those parents um, or those moms when taking extra vitamins, okay? So when we talk about hypervitaminosis, one thing that we need to be aware of is the early signs of hypervitaminosis. Um, so this is where your assessment as a nurse really comes into play and you have to determine is this patient jaundiced or is this patient getting too much vitamin A. So here's how you tell the difference. So with jaundice, you're going to see that yellowing of the skin pretty much all over in a consistent pattern on the skin if you have some type of liver failure or something like that. With hypervitaminosis, you're only going to see that yellowing of the skin on the nose and the ears. So when you assess that patient and you're documenting, make sure that you're relaying in your documentation the color of the nose and the ears in relation to the rest of the face or body, okay? So moving on to vitamin D. Vitamin D has a couple of categories. You can see we have vitamin D2 and vitamin D3. Vitamin D2 is less available than vitamin D3. Um, vitamin D3 is found in fish oils and as many of us um, prefer sunshine. Okay, so the main function of vitamin D is, <clears throat> excuse me, movement of calcium and phosphorus into um, intestines, our kidneys, and bone. Okay. Vitamin D is extremely important in our bone um, formation. Many of you, if you're old enough to remember a childhood illness called rickets, that was a um, deficiency in vitamin D. Um, this stemmed from diet, of course, and some of you may remember some talk about <clears throat> uh, submariners or submariners in the Navy who are deprived of sun, of course, and then when you're out under the water, you have limited access to certain foods, so they were lacking both sunshine and diet. So when we talk about vitamin D and we're looking for toxicity, um, this would include signs of anorexia, nausea, a general illness that is unexplainable, weight loss, which may stem from the anorexia, and then um, stiffness. And also remember that 
Um, when we look at this, vitamin D has an effect on bone. So we look at what our bones produce and how that affects us. Um, so a normal healthy bone would produce some red blood cells. And so if we are not getting what we need as far as vitamin D and healthy bones, then we're going to see that start to decline also. Now there are times when we can do a specific calcium level for patients, especially maybe some cardiac patients, um, if they're on a normal regimen of vitamin D. So be mindful of those. Know your calcium levels. <clears throat> Now, other than sunshine or sun exposure, we typically get vitamin D from fortified foods. You see fortified everything when you start looking at some of the labels. Um, most of the time you're going to encounter milks, um, infant formulas, of course, are fortified. Of course, healthy bones for them um, is extremely important. Fortified cereal is a big thing. Um, so most of the time when you're looking for sources of vitamin D and sun exposure may not be an option, look for those fortified foods. Now moving on to vitamin E. Um, vitamin E is essential in um, all of us in that it stabilizes our red blood cell walls. Um, it prevents them from destruction. Okay, so vitamin E what you really need to know about this one is um, it is the least toxic of all fat soluble vitamins okay and the major source of vitamin E primarily um, comes from beans corn nuts and um, soy of course and then your leafy green vegetables and then lastly let's talk about vitamin K vitamin K of course aids the liver in forming certain factors um, that are essential in blood clotting okay your thrombins and things like that so once we move into OB um, you'll see that infants are given typically given a vitamin K injection right after delivery unless their parents refuse and that is their right to do so um, but they're given vitamin K to prevent some of the hemorrhagic diseases of the newborn so their liver is immature, so they don't always have the best clotting factors um, soon after delivery. So here's one of the most important things about vitamin K that if you um, want to grab a pen and paper and write this down, you will definitely need to know this, um, is that vitamin K is actually the reversal agent for warfarin. Okay. So if you have someone overdose on warfarin, you're going to give them probably an injection of vitamin K. Um, it does not counteract heparin. Okay, so be mindful of which one it works in reducing or reversing an overdose of. Okay, now vitamin K is um, normally found in liver and some leafy green vegetables. And I will say that typically... IV administration is not a preferred route because there is such a risk for um, a reaction or the risk of anaphylaxis with that injection. Let's look at vitamin C and vitamin B. One of my favorites is vitamin C in that um, it is important in the formation of collagen. Um, it's healing properties and it aids in the absorption of iron. <clears throat> so it has several different roles. Um, it also aids in bone and tissue repair and energy. Without vitamin C, our energy level would not sustain. Vitamin C also maintains um, blood vessels and um, assists our immune system um, in resisting infections. I think at some point in our life, we have probably all heard of scurvy. Um, this has 
been a condition from long ago. Um, you rarely ever hear of it nowadays, but scurvy was just a condition that was caused by lack of vitamin C in the diet. Um, so this would come from especially people who stray from or refrain from eating fruits and vegetables. Um, they're lacking that vitamin C. A couple of good sources of vitamin C, of course, would be one of our most favorites, oranges, um, grapefruits, beef liver, and then again, your green leafy vegetables. So we need to be sure that we educate our patients on sources of vitamin C. So let's look at our B vitamins. There are several of them. They are water soluble. So the first one we're going to talk about is vitamin B1. Otherwise, there are six of them. Uh, vitamin B1 or thymine is an important part of our metabolism when it comes to carbohydrates and energy. So some reason or some of the reasons that your patient might be deficient in vitamin B would be those who have some type of gastric issues and they're not absorbing appropriately. Um, this goes or leads you to the fact that your patient is deficient in some intrinsic factor because without that intrinsic factor, it is not absorbed appropriately. Um, so these patients could be um, experiencing some extreme vomiting for whatever reason, think about your pregnant mom um, or your alcoholics. Remember how alcohol can affect the absorption of many things, um, and this B vitamin is one of them. Usually reactions to this B vitamin is mild, um, mostly sweating, itching, and nausea. Now, an adverse reaction is going to be your anaphylactic shock, okay? Um, typically, we avoid giving this in an IV form. Now, vitamin B2 is riboflavin. It also plays an important part in metabolism, um, but this one incorporates protein and fats also. Um, so the patient, when you're assessing for a riboflavin deficiency, um, you're going to see these patients with cracks in the corners of their mouths. They may have uh, a burning sensation in their tongue and lips, and they may even have a sore throat. Okay, so be mindful um, in knowing the difference between riboflavin and the next B vitamin that we're going to talk about. So when you educate your patient on um, this particular vitamin, riboflavin, some of the common foods that you may find riboflavin in is going to be your dairy products, your um, green leafy vegetables, and organ meats such as liver. Okay, so now riboflavin, you do need to warn your patients it can turn their urine yellow, a deep yellow. So Tell them not to be alarmed. So vitamin B3 is also purposeful in cellular energy. Um, this one has also been found to treat um, high cholesterol levels. Um, so some of your patients might be taking it for hyperlipidemia. So now if you're looking for deficiencies in niacin, this is different from riboflavin. It um, involves the oral area, but with this patient, you're going to see a beefy red tongue. It almost looks swollen. Um, it's going to be a smooth looking tongue, and they most likely will have some swallowing difficulties um, or even some inflammation in their mouth. So know the difference between the two and what you're assessing for when it comes to those two deficiencies, okay? Um, usually itching is also a side effect, and it's typically relieved with Benadryl or something of that nature. Um, some sources of niacin, of course, are going to be your lean meats, um, cereals, especially your bran or whole grain cereals or enriched breads, okay? Now, you do want to be mindful of your patients who take beta blockers and calcium channel blockers because it can increase the side effects of niacin. So your patient might... Um, experience an increase in um, blood vessel dilations and so that's when you're going to start to see that hypotension or your postural hypertension, hypotension 
Okay, so be mindful of um, telling them to change position slowly, especially when standing. Now, one very particular or very alarming um, side effect of niacin is if it's taken in conjunction with red yeast rice, which a lot of patients will take to reduce those cholesterol levels, it can cause rhabdomyolysis, which is simply um, breaking down that muscle, and it can cause kidney damage, so educate your patients on that. Vitamin B6 is otherwise known as pyroxidine. Um, typically, you'll see this in your older populations or women of childbearing ages. Um, if you have someone who is taking an oral contraceptive, it can um, induce that B6 deficiency. Um, Now, with B6, we have to be mindful of taking it appropriately because high doses can cause um, neurotoxicity, okay? So, this is where you're going to see that loss of um, the body control in your limbs. They may experience some numbness in their feet. And this medication um, is also one that you cannot give with levodopa. Now, with the neurotoxicity, we, we can see that with a loss of control in those movements, it can sometimes mimic Parkinson's, the symptoms of that. So it would make it hard to differentiate between the two. Is it neurotoxic symptoms or is it something to do with Parkinson's? So if we're giving them levodopa, it could mask the symptoms of that neurotoxicity of your B vitamin. Now, folic acid is um, otherwise known as B9. I've never really called it that, but folic acid is required for erythropoiesis. And if you remember what that means, it's simply red, red blood cell formation, okay? Folic acid is typically used in the treatment of anemias. Um, so you may see folic acid being given to some of your um, alcoholics or people with some type of um, hepatic disease, okay? Now, folic acid is huge in pregnancy. Um, we start our pregnant moms out taking this as soon as we discover that they are pregnant because they have found that with taking folic acid during pregnancy, we have been able to reduce the number of infants who have those neural tube defects. The biggest sources um, are going to be your fruits and vegetables, and then, of course, your cereals. Um, they're fortified with folic acid. Now, B12, of course, is needed for red, red blood cell um, production also. And this is when we go back to talking about that intrinsic factor and that you have to have that intrinsic factor present in your gut in order to be able to absorb many of our B vitamins, okay? Um, B12 is particularly used in the treatment of pernicious um, anemia chronic and chronic liver disease, okay? So with B12, <clears throat> when you're looking for deficiencies, you're typically, I'm so sorry, typically going to see deficiencies in B12 in patients who are strict vegetarians because vitamin B12 is typically only found in animal products. So if you're vegetarian, you're not eating meats, of course, okay? Now, you can see them again in patients who may have malabsorption issues um, and things like that because you have to have that um, intrinsic factor present. So when you're teaching your patients about sources of B12, some of the Listed ones in your book are oysters, non-fat dry milk, fermented cheeses, and seafoods, um, lobster, scallops, um, tuna, and clams. It's also present in organ meats like liver, so you'll want to be familiar with some of those recommendations. So 
we have some very important minerals, 19 to be exact, in the body, of which 13 are essential to life. Now, we know that minerals that are present have positive and negative charges. So this, of course, leads us to think about our conduction system of the heart and how these minerals can affect that system. Some of the most frequently missing minerals, especially in our diets, are going to be um, calcium, iron, and iodine. So let's start with calcium. Um, calcium is one of the major minerals. Um, it is important, of course, in bones and teeth, um, also important in muscle contractions um, and the transmission of our neurotransmitters. Um, we can easily replace calcium with supplements, but we always want to be aware of signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia and hypercalcemia. Okay, so um, hypocalcemia, of course, is just a low level of calcium and some signs that you might start to notice in your patient when um, there is uh, deficient calcium or low levels would be your muscle spasms. Again, calcium is important in muscle function, so your muscles aren't going to move appropriately if we don't have um, calcium. Aside from your muscle spasms, you will begin to um, hear your patients complain of numbness, numbness and tingling in the lips and um, face. You might even see um, fractures of the bone if we are depleted in our calcium. Um, again, it is a um, very important mineral in maintaining those healthy bones. Now, with hypercalcemia, you may start to notice that, especially if you have patients who um, take a lot of antacids, um, you're going to see those patients in your office or somewhere. They're going to start com to complain of constipation, of course, um, abdominal pain, which may stem from the constipation, and dry mouth, nausea, and some vomiting. Another important mineral is iron. Iron, of course, is very important in hemoglobin and red blood cells. Most of our body's iron is found in circulating red blood cells. So without iron, hemoglobin would not be at the level it should be. Hemoglobin is, of course, the protein in our red blood cells that is responsible for carrying the oxygen from our lungs to our tissues. Some of you have probably heard of iron deficiency anemia. That is the most common type of anemia, and these are your patients in which we need to replace that iron to increase those levels. Now, in women who are childbearing or of childbearing age are typically um, one of the most common patients you'll see who have this iron deficiency anemia. Um, and it's just due to the loss of um, either heavy menstruation or pregnancy after delivery, of course. Iron is best absorbed on an empty stomach. Um, so when you have a patient who's taking an iron supplement, supplement um, they of course may complain of a dark stool and that is normal, that is okay. Um, if they're taking an oral iron supplement, you wanna make sure that they're rinsing their mouth appropriately after the dose. And you wanna make sure that if at all possible, you deliver this medication through a straw or a dropper just to avoid the teeth because it can stain the teeth. Um, iron, of course, is um, found in fish, red meat, spinach, and then some dried fruits. Now, magnesium is essential in several areas, um, specifically in muscle contraction and nerve conduction, um, most importantly in cardiac function. 
So you may have patients who are deficient in magnesium, and this is where you'll start to see those prolonged um, QT intervals. And of course, we've talked about um, the QT intervals and prolonging that leads us to those dangerous um, dysrhythmias such as torsades. If you remember, we talked about how deadly those specific dysrhythmias can be. So we want to be mindful of those. Um, typically, uh, magnesium deficiencies um, are going to be in patients who have some type of malabsorption syndrome. Um, magnesium is typically obtained through um, our diet of fruits and vegetables. Um, there's an abundance of magnesium in pumpkin seeds and spinach. So those are a couple good foods that you could recommend to your patient um, if you find that they do have a deficiency in magnesium. Now potassium we've talked about briefly in another chapter, um, but it is extremely important in kidney function, muscle movement, and then um, of course again nerve conduction. So remember we talked a little bit about potassium and diuretics and how some are potassium wasting and some are potassium potassium sparing. Um, so if your patient is taking a diuretic, um, you want to make sure you assess the levels um, for appropriateness. So when we're checking those levels, we're looking for that hyperkalemia. Um, so in a patient who is hyperkalemic, you would see them start to manifest um, or symptoms manifest as some type of paralysis. They may complain of numbness and tingling in their hands and feet, and then you may start to see some mental confusion also. Oh, remember also that with hyperkalemia, this is where you start to see those fatal dysrhythmias. Um, so if our body's not excreting it appropriately, it requires an immediate attention, and typically they'll monitor those labs if they're in a facility um, almost on a daily basis. Now, you also need to be mindful of the fact that dysrhythmias can also occur with hypokalemia, okay? Um, so it can go either way. So when you want to educate your patient about some potassium-rich foods, this is going to be your bananas, your raisins, um, and some dried beans. And so lastly, let's talk about zinc. Um, zinc is important in normal tissue growth and repair, so it's super important um, and wound healing. So be very mindful of, um, especially patients who are already at an increased risk for um, a delayed wound healing, such as your diabetics. So we want to make sure we're assessing them and their zinc levels. So just some dietary foods to be mindful of for zinc, of course, is going to be seafood. Not everybody enjoys seafood, so they may um, find themselves deficient in that. Um, a lot of zinc is found in your fortified cereals, and again, you can find that in some beans. So this concludes this chapter, and I will send out information to everyone in regards to testing for this chapter. So look for an email in regards to herbals, minerals, vitamins, etc.